let's try one more problem. And this time, let's start with events A, B, and C and combine some of them to create a composite event. What does independence of A, B, and C say about a new event, let's say a union B, and an event C? Again, naturally enough, we anticipate that if A and B are independent of C, then A union B should also be independent of C, surely. Pause and see if we can verify this. Again, you will need additivity in the guise of inclusion and exclusion. You will need the distributive property of intersections over unions, and you will need the definition of independence as a rule of products. Pause the lecture and see if you can make headway before you restart and resume. So surely if we want to check the truth or falsity of whether A union B is independent of C, we should start immediately by looking at the intersection of the event A union B with C. The distributive property of intersections over unions will allow us to write this as the probability of the union of two sets, A intersection C with B intersection C. Okay, so now we have two sets and the union. Can we do something with this? Independence at heart says something about the probabilities of conjunctions, of intersections. On the right, I've got a union of two objects. So naturally, I will try to replace that expression by an expression involving intersections. And additivity, through the guise of inclusion and exclusion that we saw in Tableau 5, shows the way. Remember, if you have two events, the probability of the union can be obtained by summing the raw probabilities, but that will give you an overcount, and taking away the intersection probability. And therefore, we now have an identity on the right. The first two terms involve intersections, and the third term also involves an intersection, but C appears twice. We should do a little algebraic cleaning, since the intersection of a set with itself is itself. So we obtain now a simple identity. The probability of A intersection C added to the probability of B intersection C, from which you take away the probability of A intersection B intersection C. And now things are ripe for independence. On the right, you have expressions involving only intersection probabilities, and because independence gives you product rules for all possible conceivable intersection combinations, we now have a factor. I take a look at this and say, well, okay, various terms are common here. The term, the probability of C, appears in each term on the right. A smidgen of factorization takes it out of those terms, leaving and round brackets in front, the probability of A plus the probability of B, from which you take away the probability of A, in A times the probability of B. All of this, of course, multiplied by the probability of C. Now let's take a look at the term in round brackets. The third expression there is the probability of A times the probability of B. But if A, B, and C are independent, then surely A and B are independent, and this is in fact the first relation that must be satisfied. The probability of A times the probability of B is exactly identified with the probability of A intersection B. This is what independence gives us for the pair A and B. All right, you look at this and say, well, this man is, is going crazy. He's taken something which is neatly factored out, and he's now assembling it again and making it more complex. But of course, there is a method in the madness. Let's take a good hard look at the term in the round brackets. Does that look familiar? Look at the second line. We have an expression just like that. And introspection tells us, ah, the thing in the round brackets represents a probability of a union. This was additivity via inclusion and exclusion. The term in round brackets is exactly the probability of A union B. We are done. Take a look at the left you have the intersection of two events, a composite event with C. On the right, 
you have a product of probabilities. That of the composite event with the probability of C. We conclude inevitably that A union B is independent of C. And this argument now works beautifully and generally. Let's abstract the core principles that we've seen in our two examples. The first example said that if we have independent events and you complement one or more, you still get independent events. The second example says in words that if you have independent events and you form new events from some subgroup, then these new events are independent of those that were left out. And here now is a basis for a beautiful compact slogan. And this now is true more generally when you have independent events which are finite in number or even countably infinite in number. Suppose we have independent events. I'm not, I've not yet defined independence for more than three, but we shall do so shortly. But let us anticipate our setting. Imagine we have a family of independent events. Suppose you break them up into groups which are disjoint, which do not overlap. And from each group, you construct a new event. These new events are engendered from non-overlapping collections of these independent events. Then our conclusion is that all these new events so constructed from distinct disjoint subsets of independent events are also independent. The moment you have independence, it's preserved under such manipulations. This turns out to be a very powerful and general principle. And of course, it's comforting that this is exactly what we would anticipate in our vague use of independence in ordinary language. If there are things out there which are independent of things out there, then results which depend upon these phenomena are independent of results which depend upon these phenomena. And our mathematical demonstration captures that intuition beautifully. Our next step is to abstract and move beyond three events to a large family of events.